All right, this time if you'll turn in your scriptures, I'm going to ask Brother Charlie to come up and read to us. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 to 22. So if you'll turn there in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and verses 15 through 22. Brother Charlie. Good morning. Good morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 15 through 22. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you before, that ye might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness, or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be yeah, yeah, and nay, nay. But as God is true, our word toward you was not yea and nay. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. For all the promises of God in him are yea. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us in God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Amen. Let us pray together. Father, we do ask that this morning you would give to us the opportunity to hear your words, that your Holy Spirit would be the one that prevails and, and has all the authority during this time. We ask, Father, that we would uh, be able to give you our attention. Open our, uh, our eyes, our minds, and our hearts to receive this engrafted word, to receive the truth of the scripture. From the life of Paul that we might uh, see a living example of what it is to be faithful, committed, and loyal to the Lord Jesus Christ and to his people. So we ask, Lord, that today uh, would be your time, the perfect liberty within us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we are at a time in Paul's life, in his ministry, when there seems to be some uh, question as to whether or not he's actually an apostle. And part of this is because even back in the early days of the church, during that period of time, there would be the, the new generation, shall we say. There'd be that set of uh, preachers that would come along and question the authority of the scriptures, question the authority even of the Apostle Paul, they would find their way within the Corinthian church. Remember the Corinthian church exalted wisdom. At least the, the background from which they came put a high price, a premium on wisdom. And so men had to be wise, men had to be orators, men had to be uh, able to uh, speak to the people. And the, the measure of their intelligence and the measure of their speaking skills and eloquence was oftentimes on a point system. Well, Paul was not like that. Paul was a very, very ordinary man, a very ordinary apostle, and his lifestyle probably was far below the living means of most of the people of the Corinthian church. But at the same time, as while well, Paul is out visiting other churches and in Judea and in Rome and places like that, he's still doing his missionary work, this new breed of, of false teaching would enter in. And in order to present yourself as a false teacher without being a false teacher, the only way that you can be effective and gain the influence and the attention of the people is to undermine what authority and the pastor that is there. And that is exactly what they attempted to do. And so Paul is, in the very beginning of this letter, and especially as we are in this section of chapter 1, is uh, decidedly uh, fickle. He appears to be by the idea of the false teachers that here's a man that cannot be trusted. He uh, says one thing and does another. He's the man that said he'd come to see you, but he did not. What's up with that? And so they would lay then this charge against him, if you can't depend on him to do what he said he would do, how can we depend upon him to be an actual apostle of God and preach the word? Now, false teachers are not interested really whether the word is preached or not. They're more interested in popularity and gain. 
And so, in order to uh, take advantage of the situation, Paul did make a change of plans, but what they would do is take that change of plans and turn it into a, a rebuke against him and a level of charges like the, this, this wavered guy, double-minded, and you, you can't really depend upon him. So that's the background. This is the kind of situation that Paul is dealing with in this local church. Remember, he's been there. He started that church and stayed there as their pastor and building it for 18 months, a year and a half. They knew Paul. They knew who he was. But nevertheless, he's, he has these issues. Not only that, there was sin within the church. There was a, an incestuous relationship that was taking place. And, and he knew that. And he had to deal with that problem. So with that, we find Paul, here's a man that nevertheless, even though all this is in the background, here's a man that demonstrates a profound amount of loyalty to his people. Here's a, a, an apostle and a man that we can, we can gain so much insight and be challenged in our own heart uh, that his concern in his loyalty to the Corinthian church was not so that he could be on par with and reprove himself as a grand preacher, but rather his loyalty was church because they were the people of God. If you can just remember the words Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep. And so the us as people, the Corinthian church, were the, the sheep of God's pasture. And Paul's responsibility was to feed them, to nurture them, and to help them grow. So his loyalty to making sure that he could visit them, his loyalty to coming back to see them at a later time and addressing the issues was not so much that, that uh, it would be on a secular thinking, I have to maintain this church. After all, there is a certain amount of missionary support that I get from them, but rather because they were the people of God. They were the children of God. They were brothers and sisters in Christ. They are located, and they needed his attention, and he was going to give it to them even with the hardship, even with the struggle, even with the debates that were taking place and the accusations that were charged and leveled against him, hurled at him at times. And so we see that the, in these verses, we'll, we'll get to it in its contextual sense as we go along, but what stands out in these verses that we read this morning is here's a man with a sense of loyalty and perseverance and commitment to a church, to God's people that needed his help and there was nothing that was going to get in his way. He was unwavering in that commitment. And I believe that in our day and age in which we live, Paul rises above. Paul stands as a model example, a premium example of what it is to follow through with commitments and promises and be loyal to the end. A sense of loyalty that, that would give him a life-term track, a trajectory that was not going to be changed. And we can learn lessons from that on this very subject of loyalty. So this morning, we're, uh, there's just going to be three, uh, there are four points total. We're going to look at the first two here in the morning hour. We'll look at the second two this evening. And with that, we would, we would recognize the fact that loyalty has its priorities. Secondly, loyalty is intentional. The third is going to be this evening, loyalty is decisive and loyalty is binding. So we have the priorities. We have that there is an intentionalness in loyalty and decidingly that's what I'm going to do. It is decisive. There's no waffling or wavering. And then, third, fourthly, it is binding. It is a binding commitment that we dare not back out of. Now, that puts a whole new emphasis, a whole new definition on the idea of loyalty. A Google loyalty on your free time, not this morning. Pay attention to what I'm saying now. But Google loyalty on your free time, and you will go to marital relationships. You will go to friendships. And the question is going to be, how do I prove my loyalty to my, either your spouse, your significant other, or a friend, or what have you? And there are some insights that are in there. You can't throw it all out. But loyalty on a secular level has more to do with how we win and gain influence and maintain friendships or maintain marital relationships. 
Loyalty, from a biblical perspective, has a different worldview. It has a different outlook. Its demands are higher. Its expectations are higher. Its qualifications are greater. It's rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, as Christians, when we use the word loyalty, when we use that term, and we say that we want to be loyal, we start at the top first through Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the body of Christ, and one another. And then they can have the, the trickle-down effect that it's going to help and definitely affect lateral relationships. So loyalty in our friendships, loyalty to one another, is only going to be as effective and as strong as our loyalty to Jesus Christ and the gospel. If that loyalty wavers and we're double-minded about how faithful we are going to be to Jesus Christ, don't expect your loyalty, your commitment, your perseverance to friends, family, husband or wife, children, whatever it might be, don't expect that to have any real strength. It's only going to be as strong as your commitment to Jesus Christ. That is the way that God built the economy of the heart, of the human heart. So I want to give you just a, an overall standing definition of what we're talking about when we say loyalty from a biblical worldview. And this, this slide will be up there pretty much for the rest, and I'll go back to the outline here in just a moment. But as we learn lessons, as Paul is in defense of his integrity and on this virtue of loyalty, which you'll see how this unfolds, note this, that from a biblical worldview, loyalty is a virtue and a practice. It's intended to please God and bring glory to him by faithfully honoring my commitments to Christ and his church. It is showing his firstness in my character as one that can be trusted. I'll just only repeat it a little bit faster for the sake of a listening audience. Loyalty from a biblical worldview is a virtue and a practice intended to please God, to bring glory to him by faithfully honoring my commitments to Christ and his church. It is showing his firstness in my character as one that can be trusted, so that God can trust us, and we can be trustworthy with one another, faithful to one another. Why? Because our biblical world says this, that God is first. He is unique. There is a supremacy there that is recognized, and so my worldview operates under that perception, under that understanding, under that reality of the very existence and the nature of God. And now we bring that and we apply it to the subject of loyalty as we see it operative in the life of the Apostle Paul. So let's go to verse 15. And in this confidence I was minded to come unto you that you might have a second benefit, and to pass by you into Macedonia, and come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you be brought on to my way into Judea. Now we're going to see that here Paul, as he speaks of his loyalty, is, is interested in people. But even with this, there are three observations that we're going to make when we talk about loyalty has its priorities. Loyalty has its priorities in three very, very, very crucial, significant areas in the Christian life. Number one is going to be that, that we have a loyalty to Jesus as a disciple, to be loyal followers, to be committed followers. You see, Christianity is not a two-phase, two-step uh, program in which we get into. When Jesus invited the disciples to come follow me, when he preached to the, to the people and when the apostles preached to come follow Jesus, to come and to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it was not, and be saved today and then tomorrow become a disciple. It was not be saved today and someday in the future there will be an evangelist or revival preacher that's going to come along and he's going to invite you to come up front. And in that day you can be committed. Commitment in the biblical sense of the word, the way Jesus presented the gospel, was, was this, that to be saved is to be a disciple. To be saved is to be a follower. There was no two-tier system as we see it today. We have a houseful of people that go to churches that are saved but not committed. 
They depend upon the commitment of God to satisfy His Word and to be faithful to the, the work of Jesus Christ on the cross and to cleanse them from all unrighteousness, to be born again and to be kept secure, not to be removed from the hand of God, not to be plucked out. But there's no sense of commitment, no sense of following, no sense of loyalty. If it is, it's measured. It's decided by, as Paul would say, fleshly wisdom, whether or not, well, this is okay, but that is not okay. That's asking a little bit too much today. But rather, a loyalty first is as a, as a believer. If you claim to be a believer and are saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, then God has a claim on your life. You are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so our obligation is to use this temple for God's glory and his honor. Secondly, in this has priorities, loyal to the, as to the scriptures as a church, our loyalty to the word of God. What does the scripture have to say about, and then particular issues of life? Now, I did a little research on this, and you know how Pew Research and Barna, they, their, their words, the titles of those two organizations focus primarily on Christian uh, surveys and churches, uh, whether or not they're a denominational, non-denominational, uh, saved or non-saved. They, they use the Christian in the general sense of the word. And then they will, in a lot of times their surveys, they will narrow it down to, let's just say, a Baptist perspective or a Reformed Presbyterian, things of that along those lines. But this is what they found. On, on the subject of relevant issues, that uh, say, for example, uh, should women be allowed to have a place at the pulpit in pastoral churches? That would be one. Uh, what about our views toward uh, same-sex marriage and, and homosexuality? Where, where does the church stand on that? Well, on those kind of, in those things, in 2007, then there's another survey taken in 2017. So a 10-year period of time. The, the, uh, the acceptance of, in those two areas, of uh, uh, that, that change of policy, that change of biblical doctrine concerning human sexuality and that of authority in the church uh, went up by 10 points. In other words, more than 10%, over 10%, between 2007, 2017, to over 10% of the people said they, that this is acceptable. The poll numbers showed that more people in, in uh, Bible-believing churches where the gospel was preached, more people are, uh, uh, accept and receive the idea without any refutation in those two categories that it, that it is acceptable and it should be a practice in, within the church. So when we talk about a loyalty to the Scripture, our responsibility as a church is twofold. Number one, to preach the whole counsel of God and rightly divide that word of truth. You see, you can preach a whole counsel of God and not rightly divide it. Well, what is important that the two run parallel, that it's like two rails on the same track. You, you have to have both. You can preach all the counsel of the Word of God, but the counsel part has to be rightly divided so we know that what God's Word is saying. We have to understand that it, is, it does not change. It, and it's, it's the same yesterday, today, and more, just as Jesus Christ is. And so with that then, as we preach the Scriptures, rightly divide the Scriptures, the responsibility of the church as listeners to the pulpit is to pay attention and to give attention to right preaching and a proper understanding and to search the scriptures and make sure that they become the final rule and authority as our articles of faith say in most churches that the scriptures will be maintained as the final rule and authority for all matters of the Christian life. And for that matter, all matters of, of the world, whether or not they agree with it or not. Thirdly, we have a loyalty in our marriages as, as our spouse, a loyalty to one another, husband and wife. And here again, it's, uh, when, we, when we use that phrase, we're honoring covenant relationships. We're honoring covenant promises. Now tonight, we'll, we'll get into uh, Jesus' words on oaths, because later on in our text this evening, Paul, as God is true, is probably making an oath to verify his own integrity. 
But when we talk about marriage, loyalty to marriage, loyalty in a marriage is loyalty to a covenant promise. The I do or the wedding vows. And they are irrevocable, unchangeable. And so something needs to be said about doing a change up later on for whatever reason we might come up with. So we have the loyalty in those three areas. Loyalty has priorities. The priorities are our discipleship to Jesus Christ, our uh, ministry, our carefulness in preaching the scriptures, and our uh, loyalty in our marriages to a spouse. Now I say priorities because it, you can back away from the scriptures and we can apply loyalty to wherever you want. You can have a loyal dog. You can have a loyal friend. We can have loyalty to one another that it will be there and help out as much as we can. Those are lateral relationships and they're very good. They need be. But when we put it in terms of a priority, if we had one, that would be number four. And it would only be because the downward effect of a commitment to Christ, to the scriptures, and then to a marital relationship is going to also hugely affect your relationships and friendships and, and the people that you own as friends and how you minister to them. Secondly, loyalty is intentional. This is where we get into our passage. When we say loyalty is intentional, listen to Paul's word. And I was mindful to come to you in verse 15 and to come on to you that you might receive a um, second benefit and to pass by Macedonia and uh, come again out of Macedonia. When he says, and in this confidence, I was mindful, I was intentional. That, that word there, mindful, can be replaced with I intended. So he, there's an intention within the heart to be loyal to a people, to be loyal to Jesus Christ, to be loyal. It, it, you, if you do not have intention within your heart, in other words, the only other option that you can have is as it comes upon you or as if the circumstances are right, or perhaps if there seems to be some kind of reward that comes with it. And sometimes that reward is a public recognition or a closer friendship. You become one that is more like than anybody else. But loyalty from a biblical viewpoint is designed to be, that's what I'm going to do. There's, there's a, a decisiveness about it. it is, I was mindful to do this. And in this, he intended to come to this church and give to them a second benefit. In other words, he said, I want to give you a second grace, a second gift. Now, it's not as if he was bringing anything in terms of material to them. But rather, what he's saying is, to, his plan was to first go through, um, pass on his way to Macedonia. I'm going to stop by and see you. Now, remember, who is the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church? He is their father, their spiritual father. 18 months of ministry in the city of Corinth. He brought them up out of paganism, started the church. And so uh, their recognition of him, by and large, generally speaking, he is our man. He is our spiritual father. He is our pastor, but he's also a missionary. And so he's going to honor that. He's going to honor that affection that they have for him and, and take the time of those slow boat modes of transportation and all kinds of hazardous weather. He's going to stop by Corinth on his way to Macedonia. And then when he goes to Macedonia and he does his work there, on the way back, he's going to stop at Corinth once again. And the third benefit, actually, that the, 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 uh, the whole idea was a second benefit, but in a way there's a third, and that is this. You can be a partaker of my ministry by him saying that you can uh, help me, in verse 16, and to pass by unto Macedonia, come again out of Macedonia unto you, and of you be brought on my way to Judea, to give them uh, that, that sending out, Paul, we're behind you, we're praying for you, we're part of your life, we're part of your ministry. And so when we think about that in his sympathy for their affections, he was, even though there were those that were trying to undo his authority, this, uh, one, this benefit is taking the time to stop and see them, to, and then to be able to help him. You know, one of the elements of loyalty is inviting another to share in your spiritual growth. Loyalty has a certain amount of two-waywardness about it. When you invite somebody else, as he did here, so that you can see me off into Judea, 
I want you to be a part of what I'm doing. It may have been financial, may have just been their prayers, but yet he's taking the time to stop by to see them so that they can be part of the sending church, if you will, uh, to this other part. So this whole visit, when we talk about intentional and this benefit, it would be to let them know how important they are to him by making these plans to visit twice. You're important to me. Remember, the mail is coming to him by way of Titus. Paul, it's not going too well right there, right now. I'm not even so sure you should go right now. There's a lot of contention. There's a lot of tension. And maybe today's not the day. Maybe you should postpone that visit. But Paul's answer to that is, I was mindful to go, and I wanted to bring you this benefit. So he's going into an atmosphere that isn't exactly inviting. And it's not because the people themselves, it's because of the sin that was on in the church, but that that, uh, underlying current of rebellion on the part of the false teachers that are trying to dislodge him from his place of pastoral work in that church. But he was going to be intentional to do it. So let me just give you uh, two very brief lessons on this loyalty as something that is intentional. And that is this, number one, loyalty never loses sight of relationships. When we talk about loyalty, we, and especially as Paul would see the church, it never loses sight of relationships. We never lose sight of our relationship, the binding relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Loyalty never loses sight of the relationship that we have within the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, members one of another. It's a loyalty that calls for affection. It calls for involvement. It decries independence, but looks for fellowship and help and relationship. And so it never loses sight of these kind of relationship. Likewise in a family, likewise in the home, our parents, our friends. Relationships are not to be cheap. They have quality. And we maintain the value of the relationship by our intentional loyalty invested in the Christ, the church, the scriptures, our spouse, our family, our friends. It's intentional by design. Secondly, loyalty never loses sight of obligations. There are obligations that come with commitments. And whether they are stated or implied by the nature of the relationship, there are obligations. You can't claim loyalty if you don't know what you're supposed to do. You cannot claim loyalty if you know that there are certain obligations that come because of a promise that you've made and then forfeit on those promises. So, for example, we would be boldly standing up for Christ and his church is an obligation that we have when it comes to loyalty to Christ. Boldly standing for the truth and proclaiming the Bible and Christ himself as loyalty to the scriptures. Loyalty to the church and one another to be there and to help in a time of need. To meet expectations and commitments. The expectations is that we will serve one another and that we will submit ourselves to one another. We submit ourselves to the authority of the word of God. These are expectations. These are obligations. Loyalty to Christ, his church, and one another never loses sight of relationships, nor does it lose sight of our obligations. And so with that, we we look at this and we say, okay, we understand what loyalty is now. We understand that it, it is a call to be in faithful to those promises and to those commitments that we've made. I'm going to put number three in here because we can do this uh, without really running over time, and that is this. Loyalty is decisive. Loyalty is decisive. If, if there's anything that lacks in the time in which we live, it's a decisiveness. Just ask somebody, hey, would you like to commit to this or that here sometime in the future? Here's, here's what we're going to do. And more than likely, not all the time, but more than likely, you will get it. Well, let me think about that. Let me see how that works out in my schedule. Let me see what's going on. Sometimes we are just overcommitted, but sometimes we just don't know what, we don't know if we want to put ourselves in a decisive, binding commitment. 
Now, on the other side of that, it's credit to the individual that might say, I really want to think that through and pray about it because that is part of a decisive decision, to think about and what will be the cost. When Jesus talked about uh, becoming a disciple, as it is to be saved, he wanted his people to know that if, if any man will follow me, he must take up his cross. And so the cross meant that he is going to die to self. It meant there's going to be death to a part of his humanity so that the ownership and the surrender would be to Jesus Christ. And he uses the illustration of uh, the man is going to build a tower. He starts a project, but because he didn't think it through, he finds out, I can't finish it, and people look at him and mock him. Oh, you said you were going to build, but you forgot to count the cost. A good military leader is a man that uh, he looks at the situation, looks at the strategy, the size of the army that he's up against and the enemy, and he begins, he says, you know what, rather than have bloodshed, let's just sit down and talk about this. So he counts the cost and renegotiates the terms of peace. It's simply the whole, oh, the whole point of all that is not to scare us away from discipleship, but rather to make sure that we think through. So we understand that there, there is a, there, there must be a, a thought process given to it. But the thought process cannot be the excuse. And a lot of times that's what it is, whereby there's the, to be decisive. So back to the surveys. The, the millennials are those people that were born somewhere between 1979 and 1994. Age category is somewhere around 30 to 45 nowadays. So those are your millennials. The millennials compared to Generation X, Generation Y, and prior to all that are the baby boomers. Some interesting, some interesting uh, works, surveys, and uh, articles are written on those. It really affects corporate industry. I was reading some of those things last night. They run into communication issues, they run into commitment issues, etc. Because these are, the, these are philosophies, and even though some people, hey, I'm a millennial, they don't even know what it means, but yet there's a mindset that presents itself and it can be somewhat identified. So they're not exact terms, but they are worldviews and, and patterns of thought that do affect anything from business to families, and to the church. One of the characteristics of in all of the articles that I read, I read about four of them last night, uh, the kind of things that college professors write, you know, and they're, they're doing this for a business, major mainline corporations, and all four of them agreed on this one thing, that the millennial generation is a non-committed generation. Now, they're very social-oriented. They're very friends with one another and get things done, but so far as uh, making a decisive decision that this is what I'm going to do. For example, in the area of marriage, millennials wait until almost the age between 25 and age 30 before they commit to a marriage. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not having any relationships at all during that time. It's all a testing process. Why? Because there's a lack of decisiveness. Decisiveness demands that things be thought through and acted upon. So when we look at Paul's life, here's a man, verses 17 to 20. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Is this something that I tossed back and forth in my mind? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? There is your key word. Well, it's a difference between purposing according to the flesh or when you drop down to verse 19, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, preached among you by us, and then going to the end of the verse, but in him was yes. And then he rolls right into the promise of God, in Jesus Christ are yes. So, a decisiveness is, is going to be this, decisively acting to do because my whole case rests upon the finality of the gospel, the promises, and so that's built into the mindset. The other side of it is that I do this according to the flesh. According to the flesh might sound something, go something like this. Uh, well, I don't know if this is really going to be beneficial to me. There's a lot of arguing going on right now, and I'm not up to that. Or it might be that uh, the, to make decisions right now would not be in my best interest. We can have excuses such as we can have a change of heart. 
There could be weather situations. We can have a change of affections. There could be a change of circumstances. You see, fickleness, according to the flesh, a lack of decisiveness is going to take place when the flesh decides what we're going to do next. And it's going to be feeling oriented. It's going to be according to human wisdom. It's going to be according to what benefits and what does not benefit. Whereas loyalty that is decisive looks at the situation, looks at Christ, the church, the scripture, and decisively acts and stands upon those things and is going to be faithfully committed to the very end. So Paul is this kind of man. He is this kind of apostle. He's a man that counted the cost and he was willing to pay the price, as Jesus said in Luke 9, verse 62. 9 and verse 62. So here we have loyalty as demonstrated by Paul. He had his priorities, he was intentional, and he was decisive. When we leave here today and we think about this, we have to ask ourselves this question. Number one is going to be this. Did we make that decisive decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior at some time, some point in time in your life? Or are you in that category, well, I think I did, I'm not sure. There was a point in time in my life when I was really on at, at this youth event and God touched my heart. You know, that we can use a, a, a whole plethora of languages and phrases and still lack that yes, there was a day I decisively and intentionally called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be my Savior. So therefore, that is the case. Having said that, then as a believer, what is your loyalty to Christ, the Scriptures, and to the body of Christ, to your marriage? What is the measure of your loyalty to that? You have to look at the, at the apostle, that in him is yes, in the flesh is yes today, no tomorrow, no today, yes tomorrow. I'm not sure. And that's what he means by yes, yes, no, no. He says, the flesh waffles, but the spirit is committed, it's decisive, it's intentional, and it has its priorities. So we measure our life. Where are you today? As our organist comes up forward this morning, and we have our hymn of invitation it's a time in which we, in our hymn is number 471. The hymn is going to be the way of the cross. The way of the cross leads whom? And it's at the cross is where God gained the possession of our bodies, of our soul, of our spirit. It's at the cross where we surrendered our lives, our entire being, body, mind, soul, and spirit to the Lord. And so if you haven't been faithfully loyal to Christ. Confess the failure and make the commitment today to be as Paul, no matter what the circumstances, I want to be faithfully loyal and committed to the cause, to the gospel of Christ, to him, to his church, and to the word of God.